eTabs offers powerful nonlinear static procedures, referred to as NSPs, for the seismic evaluation of existing and new buildings. Nonlinear static procedures typically consist of two principal components a pushover analysis and a site response spectrum. Although a nonlinear time history analysis offers greater accuracy and less uncertainty when compared to static procedures, an NSP can still provide a reasonable idea of global behavior and possible failure modes of a building with substantially less computational effort. NSPs convert multi-degree of freedom models to single degree of freedom models utilizing pushover analyses to determine capacity curves, typically in the form of base shear versus the displacement at the roof, and then use a ground response spectrum in some form with this capacity curve to determine an estimate of the maximum global displacement. In this example, we will look at two different types of NSPs. One uses a capacity spectrum method, or CSM, and the other uses the displacement coefficient method, or DCM. The capacity spectrum method is based on an equivalent linearization approach, such as used by FEMA 440EL. In this method, the pushover curve is converted to a capacity spectrum, converting every point on the curve to a spectral acceleration and spectral displacement. Next, a reduced ground motion response spectrum is converted into an acceleration displacement response spectrum, or ADRS, which is the demand spectrum. When the capacity spectrum and the demand spectrum are plotted together, the point where they intersect is called the performance point, which is an estimate of the maximum displacement. On the other hand, the displacement coefficient method applies modifying coefficients to the peak elastic displacement to determine a target displacement, as described in ASCE 4113. Based on the pushover curve, an effective stiffness is determined from which an effective period can be calculated. Using this period in combination with the response spectrum, a spectral acceleration may be obtained. This spectral acceleration is then used in an equation with the modifying coefficients to obtain the target displacement or maximum displacement. In this example, we will assume the structure we are analyzing is an existing building. The structure is two stories tall with two bays in the X direction and one bay in the Y direction. The columns are W14 by 90s and the main beams are W18 by 50s. The roof and floor are metal deck with concrete fill. Before we perform the pushover analysis, we will verify that the structure has adequate capacity for gravity loads. On the load patterns form, note that a dead load pattern with self-weight and a live load pattern are already defined. We will shut off the extrusions. and then set the load cases to run. Here we are running the dead and live loads. Once the analysis is complete, we can start the steel frame design. These sections appear to be adequate for gravity loads. We now move on to the pushover analysis and start by assigning hinges to our line objects. We unlock the model and select the primary beams. Which are W18 by 50 sections.
Then we go to the Assign Frame Hinges command. Here we will use the Auto Hinge property located at zero relative distance. Auto Hinges can be generated from tables found in either ASCE 4113 or 4117. Here we will use 4113 hinges. We have a choice of several different types of hinges and we will use the steel beam flexure hinge in the M3 degree of freedom. Next we will add another hinge at the other end of the beam. We will use the same hinge property. Next we will select the columns. and go back to the Assign Frame Hinge command. We will follow the same procedure as done with the beams, except that we will use the ASCE 4113 definition for column hinges. We can verify the hinge properties generated by going to the Defined Section Properties Frame Wall Nonlinear Hinges command. Since we are using auto hinges, we need to check the Show Generated Properties checkbox. We select Hinge C3H4, which is a hinge at the top of a column in Story 1. Here the backbone curve is displayed. In the table, SF stands for scale factor, and in this case is the moment at yield and the rotation at yield respectively. We can also show the three acceptance levels on the curve, immediate occupancy, life safety, and collapse prevention. The user should always verify that the program generated hinge behavior is appropriate for their model. Next we select all and go to the assign frame hinge overwrites command. Check that the auto subdivide Frame Objects at Hinges checkbox is active. This will discretize the members and can give better results. Next we will define the pushover load case. However, before we do that we will create an additional load case that is the dead load plus 25 percent of the live load. and we will set this case to nonlinear static so that the program can use this case as the starting point for the pushover. We will call the new pushover case pushover And it should be nonlinear static. And we'll continue from the case just defined. The load will be applied as an acceleration 
in the UX direction with a scale factor of minus 1 so that the displacements will be in the positive X direction. Under Load Application, we set how to control the pushover, and we will select a displacement control where we will push the structure to a displacement of 18 inches at Story 2, Joint 1. We will also save the analysis at multiple points so that it will be available during the push. Story 2, Joint 1 is located here. This is our displacement control point. We can now run the analysis. We will shut off the dead, live, and modal cases and select the dead plus quarter live and the pushover case. Once the analysis is complete, we are going to change our 3D view and then display the deformed shape for the pushover load case. We will select the acceptance points for the hinge states. We can toggle through the various steps and see what hinges are forming and where they are on the force deformation curve, such as immediate occupancy, life safety, or collapse prevention, as indicated by the color of the hinge. We can see that at the very end of the pushover analysis, when the displacement has reached 18 inches, only a few of the hinges have crossed the life safety threshold. Next, we will look at a result for one of the hinges by going to the Display Hinge Results command. We will look at the same column hinge we reviewed in the hinge definitions, C3H4. As we scroll, notice how the steps change and how the dot follows the backbone curve into the post-yield region and crosses the life safety threshold. However, remember that this is the state of the hinge at the end of the pushover analysis and does not necessarily represent the demand the hinge will see from an earthquake. Next, we will plot the pushover curve. Bay shear versus displacement at the roof. In this case, notice that the structure was not pushed far enough for the bay shear to drop off. As discussed in the beginning of this example, there are two ways we are going to estimate the maximum global deflection from an earthquake using the pushover curve. The capacity spectrum method, CSM, and the displacement coefficient method, DCM. We will start with the capacity spectrum method, as codified in FEMA 440 equivalent linearization. Note that the pushover curve has been converted into a capacity spectrum curve with spectral acceleration and displacement. This is the green curve. It has also generated a demand spectrum from the modified response spectrum. And this is the red curve. However, we need to adjust the reference response spectrum for our specific location. In this case, we are going to use Berkeley. And here we will set S sub S to 2.302 
and s sub 1 to 0 0.956. Now we see that the demand spectrum crosses the capacity spectrum. This is the performance point and the estimated point for maximum displacement for the given response spectrum. If we look on the table, we see that this displacement is approximately 8.9 inches. If we look at the table of spectral values, we see that a spectral displacement of 7.8 inches occurs somewhere between the fifth and sixth step in our pushover. Even when the structure looks to have adequate capacity from a global standpoint, it is always advisable to check that local collapses are not occurring, which we will do now. When we display the deformed shape for the fifth step, we see that no hinges have yet formed, and that at the sixth step, only a few hinges have crossed the immediate occupancy threshold, which indicates that there should be no local collapse for this level of earthquake. Now let's take a look at the results using the displacement coefficient method as codified in ASCE 4113. Note that our curve has returned to a pushover capacity curve. This is the green curve. Just like with the CSM example, we need to adjust the demand response spectrum for our specific location. We will again set S sub S to 2.302 and S sub 1 to 0.956. Now we see that the coefficients and target displacement have been adjusted. As stated at the beginning, the DCM method estimates the maximum displacement by using coefficients to modify the elastic displacement, as determined by using spectral acceleration obtained from the effective period. The equation is as shown here. If we take the parameters as determined by the program and plug them into this equation, we get the target displacement shown here. Note that this value is just a tad higher than that obtained using the CSM approach. And if we look at the table for the capacity curve, Nine point two seven inches again falls between steps five and six, just like CSM, so no local collapse should occur. The target displacement of nine point two seven inches gives an overall drift from roof to ground of just over three percent. Reports may also be generated for the nonlinear static procedures. As a last step, we will look at member forces for step 6, as this should approximate the maximum forces the building will see for this given level of earthquake, as both the performance point in CSM and the target displacement in DCM occur between the 5th and 6th steps. We can right-click on the members to bring up detailed force diagrams. This concludes this tutorial on nonlinear static procedures and pushover analysis.